Many animals share the same sequence of DNA that controls whether limbs grow or not. So, if you use CRISPR to replace this DNA of mice with that of a fish, a lizard, or even a human's, the legs will grow back just fine as if nothing happened. Unless it is from a sink. So what's the difference? Well, all snakes are missing 17 letters of DNA within this region. Amazingly, if you insert these 17 missing bases back into a python's control box and then put that into a mouse as before, the mouse will grow legs as if nothing happened. But why do all of these vastly different organisms share the same control structure for limbs? Did they talk to each other before evolving separate ways? What's so special about these 17 letters of DNA? More importantly, how does one randomly lose bits and pieces of DNA? And in this video, we'll soon find out that the last question is the ultimate key to answering all of the other ones. You've probably heard of the age-old tale of evolution being caused by mutations. However, that is such a vast oversimplification. If that were true, we'd still be stuck as little teensy bacteria floating around in some water. What I'm going to show you today is a deep dive into the machinery behind the hand-wavy terms like mutation, duplication, or deletion. I'll show you why life is so diverse. We'll get to see all of those cogs and gears that make evolution turn. Let's start from the beginning. Just the mere act of copying DNA to generate more cells can come with errors. A DNA copier makes one mistake every 10,000 letters. When DNA is copied, sometimes the wrong base can enter, or sometimes the base can just convert into their alternate form, which makes G look like A and C look like T. This can be dealt with in two ways. The copier itself can pause and chew back this mistake. That brings the error down to, at most, 1 in 100 million. If that fails, another mechanism can detect that mismatch and mow off that entire chunk of DNA and copy it again, bringing our total error down to, at most, 100 times to around 1 in 10 billion. As you can see, these two fail-safe mechanisms are not perfect. This can happen because the chewback mechanism can miss the mismatch because the base did not decide to convert back to normal. Wait, but isn't 1 in 10 billion such a small number it can just be rounded off to zero? Well, no. Let's look at something as simple as E. coli. Its genome is around 4.5 million letters long, and that means in one cell division, it makes 4.5 million in 10 billion mistakes. That's still small, but consider this, that's only one cell division, and each generation, the number of cell division events increases twofold. So after, say, 21 generations, that's 2 to the 20 cell divisions, it will have made 471.8 mistakes. Those mistakes can be in the same cell or in different ones, as these are all independent events. So let's just say, for simplicity's sake, that they're all in different cells. But some of you might argue that that's not always true. If mutations are really random, then why are these DNA sequences shared over many generations kept the same, even across other species, as you've seen earlier? And this here is the magic of evolution. Although mutations can be random, the selection process is not random. If just one of those mutations hits something that makes the cell survive better, gain more resources, reproduce more often, and so on, it usually goes into giving the organism more capability to make more babies. In biological lingo, this is known as fitness. The other populations won't necessarily go extinct, but the population balance will certainly sway in the favor of the better organism. To get back to shared DNA sequences, just like how World War II planes come back with holes in their wings, but not their engines, it's because all of the ones that fell out of the sky got shot in their engines. If that cell gets a mutation that destroys an important trait, it will die, so it's no longer able to reproduce more of itself. This is known as trait conservation. Whatever trait that helps a cell reproduce better in its current environment will be selected. This process applies to anything that can make more of itself, even small molecules like RNA. This is collectively known as natural selection. It's really similar to an optimization process. 
We start with a random collection of traits within these cells, then the mutations create variations in these traits, and the traits that help it survive the best get selected, and the rest just gets, well, outcompeted. This is how the system learns a new trait, which means that the next generation can start another round of enrichment and so on. Isn't that such an intuitive view of evolution? I mean, it's just all optimization. The problem is, if that is all there is to it, we would look more akin to hyper-optimized E. coli than, you know, what we actually are. And this is where nature transforms from just a mechanic that only fixes stuff to an inventor with endless creativity. So where does the diversity of life come from? To know that, please support me on Patreon. Okay, okay, I'm joking, I'm joking. But I really do have a Patreon though. The entire behind the scenes of the video is posted there already. So please go check it out and support me. Thank you. It all goes back to DNA replication. Mismatches aren't the only way DNA can mutate. Radiation, chemical, mechanical damages can also alter DNA. DNA copying can also be too fast or too slow, such that some bases get included or excluded. This is one way the 17 bases could have just been deleted. Our cells have tons of ways to commit an oopsie. But most of all, the following mechanism I'm about to explain is one of the biggest drivers of diversity. The crucial steps of making sex cells or eukaryotes is fusing two chromosomes together so that they may be brought together to the middle of the cell. You might know this as meiosis, more specifically metaphase 1. A chromosome is just a long strand of DNA that's shaped into this structure using proteins. All of your chromosomes together make up your genome. The location of fusion is detected by having two very similar stretches of DNA, because ideally, you'd want the chromosomes to be lined up at the same point. The two chromosomes can either get shuffled or remain the same, and reproduction resumes as usual. But sometimes, coincidences happen, and the other chromosome might have more than two attachment points. That means, after shuffling, one chromosome has its DNA deleted. This is known as the deletion event, and this is one way 17 bases can also get lost. The other has an extra copy of the same gene. This is known as duplication, and it is one of the biggest ways for nature to invent things. The beauty of duplication? One copy of the gene can be conserved, while the other can mutate into doing other functions. One can be a fallback to do the housekeeping function, while the other can mutate into doing another function. With this strategy, there is not much to lose if the explorer fails, there's always a safety net that will catch you. This is also one possible way that you can get one of the original machines to diverge and perform very similar reactions. It's a very modular and simple way to evolve. All of a sudden, you don't have to just optimize for one function anymore, you can now diversify into various different variations. Duplications don't occur on just the small scale of genes. They can also come from that recopying mechanism shown earlier. The whole set of genes can get duplicated by having matching contacts really far away. Or the whole chromosome can get duplicated by failing to segregate properly. This is one mechanism in which ploidy can arise, just like the baker's yeast shown above. In other words, it's ingrained everywhere in biology. And this isn't even the end of it. There are so many ways in which life became so vastly diverse. Cells can share DNA with each other, they can even work in communities and specialize into different roles. Nature is such an endless adventure. Since there are so many mechanisms and possible explanations as to why and how DNA can get modified, we decided to use umbrella terms such as duplication, indels, or mutations to explain away evolution instead. It's not that we can't explain these events, because we don't understand how they work or something like that. It's just because there are so many ways in which we can arrive at the pattern that it's just better to just use an umbrella term and shove it all under the rug. All because of the oopsies that we make when dealing with DNA. Now, even with those mechanisms of evolution, there is something beyond that. And it will tie back into our snake mice at the beginning of this video. 
There is a certain class of genes known as Hox genes. These genes control the body plan of an animal. You can see that across species, there are a lot of variants of Hox genes. But how do these variations come about? But all of this probability or possibility talk might leave some of you quite irritated. Where are all of the concrete numbers? If you want to understand evolution that way, you're going to need a lot of probability and statistics. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org, has a unique and powerful way to help you get started on that. Brilliant is where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. The interactives on Brilliant help you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not just memorization, which will help you own the knowledge you've obtained. So, while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data. If you want to dig deep into understanding evolution that way, through some of the books I've linked in the description, Brilliant has the perfect prerequisites for you. These courses are perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis. With a fully built out suit of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regressions. You'll also learn how to parse and visualize massive datasets to make them easier to interpret. Beyond that, you'll also gain real world insight by working with real datasets from sources such as Starbucks, X, Spotify, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms or click on the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So where do the various forms of Hox genes come from? Well, let's start with the simplest form from C. elegans. You can see that between it and Drosophila fruit flies, there are a few duplication events. These duplications are even more rampant a few more species down the line. But these species are both extant, meaning they're both alive. So why do they look like they've evolved from each other? Well, let's travel back in time to when the duplications happened. We've now created two species, one of which has an extra gene that can evolve on its own trajectory, but this doesn't mean that both species can't coexist at once. This is just like what we saw in yeast earlier. That's why both are allowed to reproduce. One species has the original setup, maybe with changes, while the other species has the new setup until this day. This is one of the ways that different organisms can share the same control structure. Note, this is not the only way. A lot of bacteria can also share the whole DNAs with their neighbors, as you've seen earlier. This isn't even the highlight of Hox genes. Hox genes themselves don't directly translate into body parts, but they control the genes that go and make those body parts. This includes one particular path, which controls the expression of sonic hedgehog, which controls limb formation. Another part of this recognition sequence called the ZAP, the ZRS, of snakes is missing the 17 base pairs. So the sonic hedgehog can't get activated, resulting in no limbs. Evolution conserves the control structures while modifying the workhorses downstream, creating a modular and simple way to evolve. So the reason this mad scientist experiment works in the first place is an actual reflection of how interconnected we are with other species. All of these mechanisms for evolution are essentially mistakes. My takeaway from all of this is that mistakes allow us to explore more avenues and not single out on one single method that can leave us stagnant. But they have to also be balanced out by a safety net so when we fall, we don't break our backs. You are a project of a fortunate series of mistakes over billions of years. So don't be afraid to make them. You might just strike gold one day.